This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 339 of the Yellow World Pods. I'm your host Stefan Butzko and today we will talk about Giovanni Reina writing Bundesliga history against Freiburg, how Dortmund will F up in Hoffenheim this time and we will take a look at Dortmund's first Champions League tie against Lazio Rom. For all that and more joins me Matthias Suk. Hello Matthias, how are you doing? Hey, Stefan. I am doing well. Uh, very, very, very busy and stressed and days, hours, maybe even just minutes away from welcoming another child to the world. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. How are you doing? <laughs> it it sounds like most of your stress is yet ahead of you. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> but then on top of it, we've got uh, remote schooling right now. So I got that going on and work and yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, my wife and I are moving houses this week pretty much or the next two weeks. And yeah, it's it's a very busy time for us too. We're currently in the middle of pretty much painting everything and taping and all that kind of stuff that you need to do. Uh, so yeah, if if you don't hear as much from me and, and others on on the, off the yellow wall, uh, that is pretty much why. It's just that right now time, uh, yeah, is is not available to me to do any fun stuff Dortmund related. But uh, at last. Here we are, uh, after the international break, I, I guess, even though not every uh, player has returned yet as uh, of day of this recording, as we are recording this on Thursday. So, Matthias, before we talk about the inevitable L in Hoffenheim and then the Champions League, um, we we are yet to talk about the uh, 4 nothing win against Freiburg, which was uh, fun in, in many ways. Um, What's your main takeaway from this game other than the three points? Um, well, I mean, it was kind of a, a match in in thirds. The first third sucked. The second and the, the, the last two thirds were pretty amazing because it was almost like exactly at the 30-minute mark um, that the game shifted thanks to Marco Reus. And uh, after that, Dortmund were kind of in cruise control. And it was a typical... Dortmund Freiburg match to to some degree. I mean, there are many a times that a Freiburg have come to the Westfalen Stadion, started well, put a lot of pressure on Dortmund, to, you know, disturbing their build up play, and then after Dortmund score a goal, it just all falls to pieces, and Freiburg are are toothless after that. And that's basically how this match unfolded. Uh, except that I felt that after about 10 minutes, Freiburg were relatively toothless. But unfortunately, so was Dortmund until Marco Reus decided he'd had enough of everything and uh, changed the game and the mentality of the team, I would say, single-handedly in a moment. Yeah, I think you're talking about him winning the ball via counter-pressing very high up the field and then feeding it to Gio Reyna, who uh, then... Uh, went on to pass it right into the path of Arling Haaland, who then uh, had a nice little cross shot uh, and, uh, you know, put it into the far corner and the uh, Freiburg keeper couldn't really do much about it. I think he nutmegged a defender in the process. So that was really uh, a really nice goal, um, very well executed. And um, it's kind of funny how Anfavre stylistic it feels like when uh, a Dortmund player wins the ball in the final third that high but uh, you know that that is just uh, the uh, typical Marco Royce play I would say just because his counter pressing and his ability to tackle and and win the ball in the way that he a does not commit a foul because that would stop the play and lose position again and, and b win it in such a way that the next touch or the next two touches are actually uh something that 
you can do with the ball. Um, that really helps massively. And uh, yeah, I think right now Dortmund's biggest strength really is their counter attack and uh, their, their counter pressing, their transition play. Um, as, as you sort of insinuated before, is that Dortmund's position game and building something without uh, the opponent making a mess is is still rather tricky for for them. Uh, am I, am I correct with that analysis? I feel like uh, Dortmund's position isn't isn't up to where it needs to be yet. No, oh, absolutely. I mean they 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 have possession. They just don't do shit with it. I mean that's the the biggest problem. I was getting so frustrated. I was getting so angry. Um, watching the first 30 minutes, and usually I don't tweet a ton during a match because I'd kind of like to see the match. But then I, I just had enough because I thought I'm seeing what I'm seeing and tweeted, you know, how frustrating it is. And then don't one score. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I guess I just had to say something. <laughs> um, but it, it just, you know, Freiburg was happy to let Dortmund have the ball, which we know sometimes Favre likes, sometimes he doesn't. Um, and then just kind of, you know, they pressed a little bit, but then they sat back, not quite like Augsburg, who were more disciplined than Freiburg. Uh, but it was, you know, Dortmund just kind of moved the ball around a little bit. There was no speed. There was no urgency, kind of something that you also, uh, talked about, uh, about analyzing, uh, the, the Augsburg results in that there was just, there was nothing there. The positional play uh, offensively for Dortmund was non-existent. I mean, yeah, they stood in a position, but that's about it. There was no movement off the ball. I mean, there was just nothing there. And you could see players getting frustrated. Uh, Holland, very much so. Uh, Marco Reus, very much so. And in that situation where Reus pressed, counter-pressed, won the ball, and then everything happened quickly. It wasn't, you know, if you think typical counter-pressing under Klopp, it's like the whole team presses and moves and stuff like that, and there are no spaces left. In that situation, had Marco Reus not done that, there was a huge gap behind him uh, just because the team isn't, there's no team pressing in the opponent's half. That's not what Lucien Favre does. That's obviously not what he wants. He does it situationally, but... Overall, it's not a mantra of his. And that was just really frustrating to see. Like, if any attacking player would press and the opposition would get around it, and you saw this also against Augsburg, then there were just huge gaps. And if there's one thing you learn about pressing, either everybody does it or you don't do it because you leave yourself open. It helps if you have a passive opponent that doesn't know how to exploit it or doesn't want to exploit it. But these are just the things that... Dortmund really, really need to work on, uh, not necessarily against good opposition. I feel like there it's less of an issue, but against, I'd say, mid-table and below opposition, if they don't address these things, it's going to be difficult more than not. Yeah, especially since uh, Dortmund are slowing things down off the ball and on the ball in too many uh, situations unless they they feel like there's a break and then uh, they are probably one of the fastest teams in the league <laughs> so um yeah it's it's a little bit annoying sometimes because uh, you feel like there's sort of a lull in in every game and sometimes uh, nothing happens and Dortmund survive and sometimes like Against Augsburg, you give away a ball, you lose a ball, and all of a sudden you get sucker punched, and then you do not see this sort of normal reaction that you would see that, okay, we've just conceded now, we need to show more urgency to, to get back into the game, but it's just that uh, good old, we'll, we'll just have one gear and we'll be patient and our chance will come, and then when it doesn't come, you just look a little silly. Like I said, there are also a couple of good reasons for playing a bit more efficiently and a bit more calm down, because if Dortmund are chaotic and everything is sort of havoc, uh, that in, in the past has shown isn't always the key to success for them either. And uh, at the same time, Dortmund have a lot of older players at the back <laughs> who... Uh, <laughs> who need to take things a bit slower. And uh, you mustn't forget that uh, with this schedule, 
Um, the more energy you can conserve in any possible way, the better, I would say. So um, in the end, we're complaining here and uh, the final scoreline was a 4 nothing. So um, yeah, uh, it just shows how good Dortmund really are. And uh, I mean, this game was uh, won without the help of Jaden Sancho because he still had... Uh, I don't know, officially had something uh, in, in, in fact, but uh, others have said that he was disgruntled about not going to Manchester United or so. I don't really know. So let's just leave it at that. Uh, Roman Bürki was also uh, not fit for this game, but uh, Marvin Hitz, if I counted correctly, had two saves to make because that's all that Freiburg mustered on, 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 in shots. Meanwhile, Dortmund probably could have scored even a couple more. Uh, the expected goals... For Dortmund was 3.1 to Freiburg's 0.5. So, um, yeah, it was a very, very deserved win. And uh, it was very good to see how Dortmund shut down Freiburg um, over over the course of this game. Obviously, uh, if you think about Hoffenheim coming up, uh, you know there will be a little bit more danger coming Dortmund's way. And especially without Manuel Kanji, who... Uh, tested COVID-19 positive uh, during the international break, which we'll have to talk about. It's it's going to be even more difficult for Dortmund defensively. But um, Matthias, at the same time, um, this game grabbed a lot of headlines for Giovanni Reina, who became the uh, youngest uh, player or the first 17-year-old in Bundesliga history, or at least since uh, things are written down, <laughs> as they say, starting 1992, uh, to grab three assists in one game. And uh, if it weren't for Axel Witzel skying one, he could have had four. Um, tremendous performance by him. Um, and obviously, I've, I've read the discussions whether he's further already than, than Pulisic at the same age or not, but... Um, yeah, what what do you make of of such a performance by the seventeen year old? Um, considering, um, yeah, that he even missed a couple of chances, but uh, yeah, it, it, to to me at least, it was a it was a really great performance. Oh, he did exceptionally well. I, I mean, regardless of age, uh, anybody who does that had a really really good day, and like you said, it could have been much more. The fact that he's 17, um, obviously an American uh, and both of us living here in the U.S., it, it naturally hypes it a bit more. The comparison to Christian Pulisic, I would say, doesn't make sense. They're two different types of players. Um, they're, you know, he's not perfect. He still has plenty of things he needs to work on. Uh, we've addressed the, the the cheating aspect. The diving um, is one, and obviously consistency, but he's 17. I mean, if you think about other players, I mean, I remember the first time I saw Cristiano Ronaldo play for Manchester United. He tried 20 stepovers, and Roy Keane told him in, in only Roy Keane's special way, please stop. Um, <laughs> and so it's... It's a development that's really, really fun to see, but he's also going to have massive dips. I mean, you can't forget Pulisic came on hot under Tuchel and then really, really slowed down and then had inconsistency and then came back. And, you know, it's still a development in progress as of right now, I even would say so. Uh, Gio Reyna is a different type of player, and as such, he will also have his ups and downs. But... Um, Overall, Favre's trust in the kid um, is warranted by his play, uh, with a few exceptions here or there. Obviously, nobody played well against Augsburg, but I thought he was particularly poor in that <laughs> match. Um, but uh, in this one, he shined, and it was the match that kind of worked for him. Uh, now, whether or not he can shine against in competitive matches against a team like Bayern uh, of that caliber... Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, but it's really nice to see that he, his passes are often very perfectly weighted for Arling Haaland. I, I feel like there's a, a partnership and a synergy that's building, which is obviously very positive for Borussia Dortmund. And uh, yeah, as Lucien Favre likes to highlight, um, that Giorena is just a very intelligent player, and it's really hard to disagree with that, uh, considering uh, how he plays. Obviously, one assist was... Um, a corner kick, 
which uh, for Dortmund is always good to uh, score a couple of set piece goals and was a well taken header by Emre Can. Uh, Marco Reus, I think, a bit uh, later in that half showed how it's not done. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, but um, I, I think still the emotional highlight for uh, most Borussia Dortmund fans was uh, Felix Paslak um, scoring uh, his very first Bundesliga goal. Um, I think he was subbed in for uh, Thomas Meunier. And uh, yeah, that was sort of the final counterattack of the game, Dortmund had a couple of counter attacks that they sort of wasted, um, but yeah, not this one. And uh, it was really nice. I think it was a conscious decision of Arling Haaland to square the ball um, to to Felix Paslak rather than just uh, score himself. Because if you are one on one with the keeper and you're a striker of the caliber of Arling Haaland, uh, more often than not, you end up scoring. Um, so I thought it was a really nice gesture and. Uh, Uh, something that Felix Paslak definitely, definitely needed. Well, and and deserved. I mean, if you look at um, how he has played this season, which is, I mean, this whole discussion, Stefan, is one that I did not think we would have <laughs> uh, anymore as a Borussia Dortmund podcast is to talk about the performance of Felix Paslak. And good for him. Uh, he was kind of one of those where there were huge hopes, then huge disappointments. And now, I'm not going to say huge hopes, but there's definitely a hope there uh, that he's going to be a decent role player for Dortmund this season, at least this half of the season. And he's shown that you can you can kind of rely on him to come in and do a job, whether it's a great job or a bad job. It's, it's what you kind of want from a backup. I mean, if you look at some of the signings that uh, Bayern made now just before the deadline, Chupo Moting, um, you know, that's not exactly what you would call a, ca a high caliber or quality player, but he's a backup that can do a job. And I think pa Paslak definitely falls into that category. And I was happy for him. It's not quite the Schmelza happiness when he scored, <laughs> but there are other reasons behind that. But with Paslak, this is great. And like you said, I think Holland decided, no, I want him to score, and it'll do him a world of good, because uh, he's obviously not ignorant of Pasolak's journey over the last few seasons. So that was really great to see. Yeah, I think that really says also a lot about Haaland and uh, how the team chemistry overall is is building right now with him and around him. And I think that's, that's uh, what showing leadership is. So, um, yeah, I, I think... Um, there is there's something growing at Dortmund, um, which I hope we'll get to see in the in, in the coming months, um, because obviously the coronavirus cases are spiking in Germany. Just uh, yesterday, it was a all-time record of uh, new infections, and uh, we'll talk about the Champions League uh, in a, in a bit. But in Italy, it's the same. So I don't know if that means that football will be cancelled soon again. Uh, I mean, right now we have at least protocols and concepts in place, but uh, if more players, staff, etc. get infected, um, yeah, it's it does not seem uh, something uh, sustainable. And at the same time, uh, I think the uh, game between Dortmund and Freiburg was uh, the uh, most attended in event in Germany yet since uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, it was 11,500 people who were there uh, in attendance and uh, now with the numbers rising quickly again, this might be uh, the last game in front of uh, actual uh, people in, in the crowd in, the, in a very long time. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how things develop. But uh, Matthias, I'm a little bit anxious about uh, how much we can even preview and how, how far we can look ahead, obviously. None of us are scientists. None of us are uh, people that are actually involved in the decision making. So it's just us basically having to wait and see. But uh, it's it's something I just want to to warn people who may not uh, observe the uh, COVID cases in in Germany in particular uh, a bit closer. So um, yeah, I self haven't really dived into how the cases in and around Dortmund are and in and around Zinsheim and those regions. But uh, yeah, obviously. Uh, It's it, it doesn't bode well. Let's 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 put it this way. So um, 
Yeah. Is there anything else you want to discuss about the Freiburg game? Because I it's it's so long in the past, I don't really re remember all the details of that game. No, I think, um, you know, rough start, but then Dortmund cruised and once again blew Freiburg away. I, I think that's a that's pretty much the summary and we can move on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it was a really deserved win and Dortmund very much needed that after the loss against Augsburg. But now they face the team that uh, already took Bayern Munich's scalp. And uh, if I read it correctly, Dortmund haven't won in Hoffenheim in eight years. Whew. So um, it's 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 been a while and obviously uh, the headlines, how else could it be uh, before the game surrounds Andre Kramaric, the very prolific Hoffenheim striker who has scored uh, against Bayern, obviously. And uh, the last time he faced Dortmund in the final match day of last season, he scored all four of uh, Hoffenheim's goals in that final loss, which was uh, one of the most embarrassing defeats last season. So, um, and if I if I remember correctly, he has scored uh, seven goals in six games against Dortmund. So, um, yeah, uh, someone who has a very good uh, goal scoring average against the black and yellows. So, Matthias, same question to you as was posed to Lucien Favre at the news conference: uh, How did Dortmund contain Andre Kramaric? <laughs> Defend better, play well, score goals. I mean, that's. It, you know, I'm not going to say he's he's a player you can't defend against. Of course you can. Uh, playing with uh, maybe a back three <laughs> uh, it helps. Even though I have, I'll be honest, I have no idea how Dalton's going to line up at the back three or at the back given lack of defenders uh, or at least natural central defenders. Um I mean, he's he's a player that, that needs to be tracked. This is kind of a game where, again, I don't expect Dortmund to push very high up because if they start pushing high up, you're going to leave yourself open to a counter and you're lacking pace. I mean, Emre Can, yeah, he's, he's okay pace-wise. Hummels, meh. Pischek, meh. And Akanji would because he's one of the fastest defenders in the Bundesliga. Um, but uh, obviously that's not an option. So I, I'm not going to say Dortmund are going to have to play a passive game against Hoffenheim, but a, a very careful one, to say the least. Yeah, just uh, concerning Akanji, I just want to reiterate again how nonsensical I find these international breaks in g given the conditions, and obviously uh, players would get more infection if they have to travel around the globe, which is also why I find it a bit questionable to have Champions League games currently. Um, but yeah, it's it's very stupid because uh, it might have been, I don't know, was it Shakiri or he had like a false positive? I don't I don't re really know how, uh, how and why Akanji tested positive, but uh, either way, it was utterly preventable by just not having these stupid international games that really don't help anybody, I feel like, right now. And, uh, yeah, obviously a big problem for Dortmund. The same as, I think, um, there are still a couple of question marks behind Rafael Guerrero because his teammate Cristiano Ronaldo tested positive and, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's it's really annoying how, how carelessly things are being handled right now and... Uh, how preventable they are, you know. I know there's a uh, year 2021 or whatever, but you know, if it, if it can't happen, it can't happen. What do you what do you want? You know, it's. I I think there are more important things in 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 life than than football or sports in general. Uh, while uh, as, as like we like to say in German, die schönste Nebensache der Welt. Um, but it's it's not a main thing. I know there are a lot of jobs involved and a lot of money, and I I get that, but. Uh, you know, we still should prioritize prioritize the health of of people and especially players because, uh, you know, it's 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 a very uh, hideous disease that can uh, also target the lungs of a very healthy person and uh, especially if you're a pro athlete, um, something like that can actually just tank your entire career and uh, I would like to not see that happening. So um, thank you very much if we could just cancel the next international break. Altogether, I don't know what your opinions are on that subject, but uh, I'm peeved. 
Well, I mean, my opinion on international football outside of major tournaments is basically I just don't care anymore. Um, it, it's it's a money thing at the end of the day more than anything else. Um, and, and that's why a lot of these organizations, you know, when they talk, talk, preach morality and ethics and this, that, the other, I roll my eyes because the, the moment money's involved, uh, a lot of leagues and organizations tend to, you know, not talk about it. So, um, it's, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, even going down to like the under 21s for Germany, who had to go to Moldova, I believe. You know, I mean, it's kind of one of those where it's like, really? Now? Do do we really need to do this? Um, and, I mean, Euro 2021, I mean, just move it to 2022 and just cancel the Qatari World Cup. I mean, I think that's a good compromise. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I mean, I don't care about the international football right now. Like you said, there are other more important things to deal with. Um, and I believe that when it comes to financial aspects and employment and job security, which is something, the socioeconomic aspects of, uh, the COVID-19 crisis is something that definitely needs to be looked at and taken into consideration. League football um, is significantly bigger globally uh, when it comes to financial ramifications for regions, uh, people, employment, stuff like that, than an international friendly. I mean, don't even get me started on why a friendly is taking place, uh, let alone Nations League or anything like that. There's not a ton of um, economics attached to that that I give a shit about. Whereas if local clubs go go away or go bankrupt people are unemployed i care about that significantly more uh rather than fifa or uefa cashing another check in that risk regard so uh i'm with you on that i i think um it's very tone deaf to do these types of uh games right now that just honestly just don't matter uh, in the grand, greater scale of the sport, but also on the more human level when it comes to these other aspects as to why we have league football right now is not just because, you know, people can, uh, can use the distraction. I think we can all agree on that. But beyond that, also the economic implications for clubs, players, not players, maybe less so, but uh, clubs and staff and, and, and regions and so on. So, yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's definitely not the best look, to say the least. Yeah, like I, I, I think, I think you can sacrifice international football if it helps save a little bit of league football right now. I think that's uh, rather well put. Now, um, back to Hoffenheim, who uh, on the last match day, after obviously beating Bayern, they lost to Eintracht Frankfurt two to one. Um, their last lineup was as follows: it was uh, obviously Baumann and Goal, and then they had uh, back three. Consisting of uh, Akpoguma, Vogt, Posh, and I think Skov and Kadarabek were like the uh, wing backs. But uh, the uh, one football app lineup tells me it was more like a 3 1 4 2. Um, but it's very similar to what Dortmund are playing right now uh, with uh, Grillich as Hoffenheim's lone uh, defensive midfielder. And then you had Geiger and Baumgartner. Um, as your double eight or double ten, whatever you want to read it. And then uh, in front, you had the striking partnership of Kramaric and Dabur. Um, what do you make of this Hoffenheim side since Sebastian Hoeneß, who I think is the nephew of uh, Uli Hoeneß, took over? Yeah, yeah, he's the nephew. He's not the son, as some people somehow want to claim. Um, and he obviously used to be the head coach for Bayern's second team or the under 23s, uh, who won the third league. And don't even get me started on that aspect, uh, as a poison Munster guy. But anyway, um, I think, uh, you know, I ranked Hoffenheim pre season somewhere in the middle of the Bundesliga. Uh, and really the main reason why I did that was because I didn't know what to expect really from Sebastian Hunes 
at this level with this squad. Uh, they dominated, his team dominated the Dritte Liga, but if you look at the disparity in player quality and player value between um, uh, Bayern's second team and the second best team in the Dritte Liga, uh, just from a financial value standpoint, uh, Bayern are three times more. So uh, th- there's a discrepancy there. It's kind of hard it's kind of hard to tell, you know, it's it's like judging a team in France right now. If you look at PSG comparatively kind of a thing, um, but uh, he's impressed me. Uh, the team has impressed me. Yes, they beat Bayern. Yes, Bayern was heavily rotated also in that that one. And then they lost against a resurgent uh, Eintracht Frankfurt. So I'm I'm not 100 percent sure what to expect. I think. They will play well. I think well, they will exploit the fact that Dortmund has a very much makeshift uh, central defensive partnership, whether that's with two central defenders or three, uh, and that will play to their strengths. Um, I think Dortmund gets the advantage against their back line if our attack against their back line. So it's kind of one of those matches that I wouldn't be surprised if you get a 4-2-4-3-3-2-3-3 type score line at the end. Yeah, what was really uh, interesting about the Hoffenheim's win against Bayern is obviously um, how vulnerable how vulnerable Bayern were uh, to counterattacks and uh, how Bayern's really high line screwed him extremely against Hoffenheim and this is probably something to avoid so um, if I were Dortmund I would probably sit back a little bit more especially considering the lack of pace that uh, you just you have just described now my biggest worry obviously um, going into this game is Dortmund's build-up play and ball circulation and how can they um, build up in the uh, fi- in their own third um I mean, you have obviously Mats Hummels in the in the center of that back line, but but uh, how does Emre Can perform uh, as a, as a left center half? Uh, is Lukas Piszczek having a couple of brain farts here? How does Piszczek, um, if 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 it happens, uh, gel with uh, Thomas Meunier, who um, you know is 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 a smart player, I think, but uh, obviously uh, when there is a lack of automatism and uh, uh, you know, a, a team like Hoffenheim that will definitely press Dortmund aggressively and uh, also physically, uh, Dortmund will definitely be bullied in this game. Uh, I'm sure of it. Um, how Dortmund handle that is is still something uh, that they haven't really shown this season uh, too many times. And uh, I have a hunch that it, it might go, it might not go too well for Dortmund. So um, this is sort of the game where I'm like, uh, Dortmund will probably lose this. Prove me wrong. <laughs> this is probably my attitude going into this game because uh, Dortmund have uh, made it uh, sort of a yeah real real habit to to fought against Hoffenheim, being bullied physically and making weird mistakes, just like Bayern did. I mean, they handed Hoffenheim a couple of goals on the silver platter. So um, yeah, this really comes down to whether Dortmund can get it together for once when they travel to Zinsheim and uh, not make a complete meal of it. I mean, the last time I was in Hoffenheim to cover Dortmund for ESPN back in the day, uh, we had, I think, Marius Wolf and Shinji Kagawa playing as number nine in that game, which in the end yielded in the 1-1 draw. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a crazy match where Dortmund were lucky in the end that Belfort deal hit only the post instead of a winner, but then the last trip to Hoffenheim was when Dortmund, I think, took the lead, and then uh, Hoffenheim came back and Kramaric scored that uh, last-minute winner. So um, yeah, it's 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 going to be a tricky game, especially especially so many players come from return from their international break on Friday, so it's not like Dortmund has any coherent way to prepare for this game which is uh, not ideal considering uh, that you lose yet another defender. So, um, yeah, uh, do you, do you want to go move forward to predictions or do you want to discuss uh, the uh, midfield lineup first? Because that's probably an interesting one too, how Lucien Favre uh, will uh, field his, his uh, double pivot, etc. 
Yeah, I mean, on that subject, uh, given everything that you just said, I mean, this is kind of the match where I'd want to see Thomas Delaney <clears throat> because obviously he brings that attitude, um, some physicality. He won't get pushed off the ball and bullied. Um, I sometimes am concerned with Axel Witzel uh, for a big guy. He sometimes gets a little bit manhandled. Um, I honestly have maybe a little bit more confidence in Jude Bellingham, uh, from what I've seen when it comes to that. Uh, so I'd be curious what a Delaney Bellingham, uh, pairing would look like. I don't foresee Favre going that way. Uh, I think he's going to go with Witzel and Bellingham, uh, depending on obviously how people, uh, how the players are feeling, which we have no insight into. Uh, but this is this is kind of one of those matches where the players that concern me would be Witzel. Uh, it would be Guerrero, who also doesn't do well in these types of matchups. Jaden Sancho doesn't do well in these types of matchups. Gio Reyna, I think he can be completely manhandled. Uh, so those are those are some of the ones where I have my concerns. I'm not worried about Royce. I'm not worried about Holland. Problem is Holland can then easily become isolated up front. Um, so it's, um, I, I wish Tog and Azad were here, uh, uh, and, and he'd be playing in this match. Cause I feel like he's less prone to let himself be intimidated by physicality like some other players. Um, but I, I just feel like this is a Delaney type match. Yeah. Also, I, I really hope that, uh, Marco Royce makes it through this game without any major injuries because uh, Hoffenheim have a couple of players that uh, sometimes are just overly and unnecessarily brutal. So, um, I mean, we, we all know about uh, Big Chuck Chich called the Eisen Erwin. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's, he's sometimes uh, a bit over the top. So um, sometimes I'm fearing a little bit for Royce's ankles who just made it back. Um, but at the same time, I will say this. I, I think uh, now that Royce is uh, has had even more time to to uh yeah come back and has had some uh, playing time it's also time for him to uh, reintroduce himself to the score sheet and to do something for Dortmund <laughs> so uh i mean he he already did the, against freiburg but i think now for him it's it, it's it, it's it's start to producing and delivering again so um i'm also curious to see what he can do and then obviously um yeah hoping that uh, Girena and Jaden Sancho uh, catch a good day and not a bad day. And uh, yeah, I'm less worried about Arling Haaland. He just needs the, the service. And then uh, we all know he rarely misses. And if, if he does, it's usually not because of a lack of effort. So we'll see about that. But uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a very weird game, especially with the Champions League uh, match coming up. And uh, yeah, I'm also not entirely sure who Favre will pick for um, the, the lineup and uh, whether Julian Brandt will play a role from the start or whether he will be a substitute. And all these kind of uh, factors where we just don't have any idea after this international break. So um, I guess with that cluelessness, we can uh, move on to the predictions. <laughs> yeah. Um, you want to go first? I don't want to go first. Sure. Um, I'm not, I'm just out of principle, I'm not going to pick for Hoffenheim against Dortmund, even though uh, I announced it loudly here. I'm just going to say Dortmund are going to win this 3-2. to two. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling a, a contentious two-all draw, but like you said, I mean, Hoffenheim, kind of like Leipzig, is one of those where it's like, I just can't ever predict you to win. If you would ask me to predict every single match those two clubs play, I will predict that they lose just on principle because <laughs> I hate them so desperately much. <laughs> yeah, see, I mean, if Dortmund showed the face they showed, for example, in the second half of the Super Cup against Bayern, um, where uh, they wouldn't back down and uh, came back uh, with the, with the fight, I think uh, then they should be fine against Hoffenheim. So it's not like the the team that can beat Hoffenheim isn't in Dortmund. It's not like they're incapable of doing it. It's just uh, that they have a history of uh, exactly against that opponent not uh, showing up and uh, being bullied. So um, yeah, 
We'll, we'll reserve further judgment for the next episode, which I'm sure will be fun because it will discuss the Hoffenheim game, it will discuss the Lazio match, and it will preview the Revier Derby, so that will be fun. Uh, all amid me moving houses, so we'll see how much uh, preparation will go into this episode. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see about that. But uh, for now, let's move on to the Champions League game, um, which I've said before... Um, I, I, I don't I don't know if I, I need to see uh, Champions League football in front of exactly no one. Obviously, a lot of uh, money is involved in these games, so um, uh, we'll, we'll see. But, uh, Matthias, you are the expert for this segment, obviously, because uh, you, as an Inter fan, have watched Lazio's last game. And from what I've heard and read on Twitter also, Lars had a comment, is that uh, Lazio don't look too good right now. I think they're ninth in Serie A. Um... I actually had that <laughs> open here just a second ago. Uh, they are, well, they're tied in ninth. Um, are they? Hold on here. Need to, get the right, need to get the right one up. There we go. Yes, they are in ninth. Um, they are tied with <laughs> with Roma. <laughs> they're, they're ahead of them on goal difference. Um, so, yeah, I watched the match against Inter. Um, and... I'll be honest, I, I felt that Lazio for long stretches in that match were better than Inter, but then they completely lost the plot, lost their head, and uh, so that was that. This is also the same Lazio side that, I mean, I believe they, be, they beat Cagliari, but Cagliari are not, not good, and they got absolutely destroyed by Atalanta, um, who are flying right now. Uh, with three wins in, in Serie A. So um, Lazio is kind of one of those, uh, let's put it under the, the German term Wundertüte, uh, where you just don't quite know what to expect. They can either be very good or very bad or just very mediocre. Um, I feel that if this match happens, um, that... It's an opponent that's very beatable for Dortmund. Yes, Lazio have some good players. Yes, Chiro Immobile <laughs> will be up for this match. I was just going to uh, ask. This is with, like the without curse of the ex. a doubt. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it kind of is. He likes scoring goals. Um, but if you look at the overall team dynamic, uh, this is definitely a, a can win. And I'm not going to say must win match that I don't like starting Champions League football with saying you must win every match. But uh, it's definitely one where Dortmund can kind of make a statement given how up and down Lazio are. Uh, but uh, if Dortmund are very passive against Lazio and, and allow them into this match and allow them to take control, then things could get very difficult for Dortmund. But if Dortmund um, show some character and uh, play well play on the front foot against Lazio I think absolutely Dortmund uh, can win this match I feel more confident with Dortmund beating Lazio than I do with Dortmund being Hoffenheim okay yeah uh, that's that's an interesting assessment obviously Giro Immobile is uh, the team captain uh, so uh, that's something I just learned <laughs> Uh, um yeah <laughs> what, what else is there to say about them so how how do they line up what who who are their strengths and weaknesses um obviously you know um the ins and outs of Lazio very well I'm sure oh yeah yeah I mean I'm I'm a Lazio -nice. I mean it's actually a club that I that I desperately deeply hate um, not, not because of necessarily, I don't like the players or anything like that. It's just, they have a, a very strong fascist block amongst uh, their supporters. And I feel like that needs to be hated and opposed at all costs. Um, I mean, they, obviously they've got some good players. Um, uh, Milinkovic Savic, uh, being a standout there aside from, uh, Immobile, um, you know, I mean, they're also going to line up with a back three. That's what they tend to do. They've got an okay back line. Uh, they've got pretty decent wing backs. They do have uh, Liverpool legend Lucas Leva in there as well. Um, they're they're not bad. Actually, their strikers in Korea and Immobile are pretty good. Um, but uh, they're, they're not super deep. I mean, it's not really a side where I, I quake in fear of. 
uh, I was more fearful of how Inter played against them uh, because I think Inter are vastly superior to Lazio. Um, but a lot of it goes through Immobile and how Milinkovic Savic plays, who's obviously an extremely good player, and it's surprising that he's still at Lazio. Um, so it's not going to be an easy match for Dortmund, don't get me wrong, but I I do believe it's a very winnable match for Dortmund. I, I feel like the matchups are favorable, and there's no... Like I said, against Hoffenheim, there's the in the head portion. There's none of that when it comes to Lazio, but it really depends on how Favre wants to set up. Again, very passive. You're going to play into Lazio's strengths. If you are uncomfortable for Lazio, uh, knowing that Immobile, though he's a good striker, he's not exactly a speed demon. Uh, Correa next to him is, is a little bit better in that regards, but, um, uh, I, I feel, marginally confident that this is a match that Dortmund's going to win. Yeah, I, I I don't really know anything about them, so I can't really weigh in on that subject, to be honest. I haven't seen Lazio in, in ages, to be honest. Uh, just going through their squad, I, I hardly know any of their players, to be honest. So, uh, um, what what I, I guess we can assume that uh, Adam Marusic will play as their left wing, big, uh, wing back and uh, Manuel... Lazari on on the right. Um, how do you think those two match up against Dortmund's fullbacks, of which I am not entirely sure who they will be? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the question. I, you know, the fullback wing or the wing back matchups. Um, if both teams play with a, a back three slash five, isn't really the area that I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the the, the central defensive pairing for uh, for Dortmund, uh, as I think uh, we, we both are for any match right now. And so that's that's definitely the one where I feel that there could be some issues for for Dortmund um, if Lazio are able to get into those positions because. Um, especially Immobile, he's just so good in front of goal. Um, he doesn't give up a ton of chances. Um, they will probably want to cede possession to Dortmund. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Uh, but the wing backs are the two positions. I'm not, it's not my greatest concern, to be honest. It's more what happens in the middle that's going to determine this. How does Dortmund deal with Milinkovic Savic, which I think they can deal with better? Um, but if it's a makeshift central defensive lineup, <laughs> um, <laughs> if, yeah, they're, they're, if, well, I mean, it's a question is it going to be two or three? Um, I think if Dortmund line up with a back four, they're screwed. I think if they line up with a back three with two wing backs, I think that that plays more favorably for Dortmund in this instance. Yeah, so the problem is uh, that obviously no Akanji still be because he needs to quarantine due to coronavirus. Then Axel Zagadou is still out with his knee injury and we still don't know when he will come back, which is terrible news because Dortmund desperately need him. And uh, no Emre Can, obviously, because if you remember, he got suspended uh, after seeing a red yeah. card in the uh, second leg against PSG when he and Neymar clashed, which I still think was a ridiculous red card. But here Dortmund now are suffering the consequences. So uh, my question to you, because I don't have an answer. Lucien Favre was asked it today and he didn't really have an answer. He just had like a wry smile. Uh, who the hell is going to play there? Uh, I think Favre's answer was, ah, we have to be creative. Uh, well, <laughs> so uh, when when pressed on that creativity, there was not much uh, coming through. Yeah, I mean, I'd be hard pressed to <laughs> pick three so, central defenders. Hummels, I mean, and mystery man. And <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, again, I I wouldn't be shocked if. Not because Favre believes in the back four in the situation. I think out of pure necessity, um, you would probably just have Pishek and Omitz. And at that point, we're gonna have we're gonna have issues. Um <laughs> I would I would hope that there's a holding midfielder, a, a truly deep defensive midfielder ahead of them. 
uh, that kind of slots that drops into the back four so that situationally you'll have a back five. Uh, if he does that, um, maybe with Vitz. Oh, God. <laughs> being that guy. Um, I mean, Delaney is probably your most likely candidate, but uh, it's going to be very interesting to see, to be honest. Yeah. Well, that's, that's one way to put it. I, f- I feel like this is going to be Comic Hill. Um, because Dortmund had a lot of situations where they had absolute makeshift backlines, and it usually always uh, ends in hilarity. Uh, not necessarily from a Dortmund perspective, to be honest. But um, yeah, um, I mean, if if it's going to happen, like you just said, when we have a back four consisting of Guerrero, Hummels, Pischek, and Meunier, um, yeah, I I'm, I'm not entirely sure how how well that works, especially when Dortmund revert to a back four where. Uh, they have shown all preseason that when they play in that system, they cannot get anything going um, in, in, in in possession. So there will be lots of possession and then a couple of sucker punch goals here and there. And uh, you're done and dusted, basically. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, re- I mean, I'm really look, not looking forward to this one, honestly. In, in I mean, so many ways, I'm not looking forward to this game. <laughs> I mean, in theory... Um, tactical theory here. If he was to play with three quote central defenders, um, I mean, you could put Pischek on the left side, Hummels in the middle, and maybe Meunier as the right sided central defender. Um, because I mean, at least he has the physical size you'd want from a central defender. I mean, he's not exactly a little guy, and then you could put uh Paslak as that right wing back maybe i mean that's a that's a possibility but uh yeah well you know speaking of wundertüte we'll we'll i guess we'll kind of have to wait and see what Favre comes up with yeah yeah so uh i'm <clears throat> i think this is going to be a very weird game and i feel like i will be glad when it's over um the good news is if Dortmund end up losing this game, it will not be the end of the world. They will still be able to come back. So, Matthias, since we're a bit short of on time now, um, please uh, give me your prediction. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to stick with the same scoreline prediction I had against Hoffenheim. I'm going to go with a two-all draw. Yeah, that would have been my prediction too, but since it's the Champions League and maybe we'll see a couple of fewer goals, I'm just going to go with a one-all draw then just just to, to add more variety to your draw prediction. I don't know. Uh, nothing makes sense. Anyway, Matthias, uh, thank you for coming on. Please tell our listeners how to follow you on the Twitter. Uh, well, you can follow me on Twitter at Matthias Uck. Um, Needless to say, right now, I have other things going on rather than checking Twitter all the time, but uh, I'm sure to be angry at some point in the next week. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I'm. Uh, my Twitter activity has uh, fallen drastically right now, too, for uh, above-mentioned reason. Um, but you can follow me at Stefan Botsko. You can follow all of us at Yellow Wall Pod on Twitter and Facebook. You can Find our written content when it ramps up again, which hopefully will be in the next couple of weeks, uh, on theyellowwall.net, where you can also find our links to patreon.com slash theyellowwall uh, for financial support. Um, we already have a sponsor for next week's episode, which I'm very excited about, but no spoilers there. Also, um, you can subscribe to this show on our YouTube channel if you feel like it. Just uh, hit Yellow Wall Pod into the search bar and you shall find it. And uh, yeah everything else we will discuss later so once again everyone out there thank you so much for listening and uh, i hope we'll be better prepared for the next episodes but uh, until then uh stay safe and goodbye